Thanks for the opportunity. And it's, um, <clears throat> you know, listening to, um, to Zephanie from J&J, &J, uh, one of the things when we were preparing for the session, we talked about really a key focus should be talking about what are, what are motivations for some of the sustainability work that we do and what a great example <laughs> that um, Zephanie's provided um, as we speak to um, a number of drivers that Dow has in its sustainability efforts. So as noted, um, I have responsibility at Dow for working about, with about 140 people across the globe that are charged with ensuring that our products are handled um, appropriately, safely, and that we're continuing to challenge ourselves relative to the use of those materials relative to the development of new materials. I thought before I would jump into the, um, to, to really talking about our sustainability efforts and sharing with you a couple of um, case studies just to ground you a bit on, on Dow, um, a, a company that is um, quite old in its history, located in Midland, Michigan, people might say, how does a chemical company end up in the middle of the Midwest? Um, Herbert Henry Dow found, um, you know, in the mid, late 1800s, um, brine wells. Um, under the, the Midland area, and from brine, of course, you can, um, can extract, can get um, chlorine and caustic soda. And so that was really the origination of the Dow Chemical Company. Bromine was also, so it was a very halogen-rich, of course, material. But I wanted to spend a moment on this because Herbert Henry Dow had a very interesting quote that I think is very apropos for our discussion today. If you can't do it better, why do it? And as I look at our sustainability efforts, it's really about continuing to challenge ourselves to um, work with our existing products in a more sustainable manner, as well as when we're developing new materials to focus on really improving the profile across the board um, as it relates to not only the chemistry, but uh, how we um, provide that chemistry to our customers and downstream markets. So I'm going to talk, as I, as I noted when I um, introduced um, my topic today, we'll spend just a few minutes talking about Dow's motivations as it relates to sustainability and, and science for sustainability, um, and then separate out kind of two different discussions. One, um, what we're doing today to really improve the sustainability profile of our existing materials. So I'll talk a bit about processes, tools that we utilize to do that, as well as a couple of case studies that give some examples of where we've looked at existing materials that we're using and developed new materials, and then carry that theme forward and talking about um, driving sustainability through innovation. So I could... Um, spend lots of time talking about um, about motivations and you see this very blank space in the center um, I'll jump to that and then I'll come back to the others you know Dow's key sustain key driver really is the fact that EHNS and sustainability is at the core of who our what our company is all about um, and the wheel that's noted there is reflective representative of Dow's 2015 sustainability goals so Dow first had EHNS goals in 2005. So, I mean, they were 2005 goals that we initiated in 1995. So, one of the first companies that actually moved forward and took some aggressive positions around um, improving um, our EHNS of our company. So, looking at reducing um, injuries, reducing waste, reducing emissions. There were some elements of product. But as we look forward and establish goals in 2015, um, you can see what's at the center of the wheel, so to speak, and it's really focused around sustainable chemistry. Um, and we've made a commitment by 2015 that we will increase by 10% those products that really have an improved sustainability profile as compared to where we were in 2005. So that's the core of what we're doing in the space of our 2015 goals. Another important area for this discussion is what we do in the product safety leadership space. I'll cover that a bit more in my other remarks. But before we move on, other motivators, and I referenced um, certainly um, our customers and our customers' customers are key drivers for some of our programs and activities in the sustainability space. 
Um, I think most of you probably are very familiar with Walmart's drive around the sustainability, I mean, the sustainability consortia. Most recently, Target has introduced their sustainable product standards. So clearly, we listen to those retailer activities. Those things clearly are motivators for the kind of work that we're doing. But we also look at regulation. We look at um, green certification kinds of programs. We look at those kinds of things to signal um, where we should spend our time and energy and focus our innovation type efforts. So just to talk a bit about what we do in the space of existing product portfolio. Um, as we, we start, you know, as we identify opportunities to address gaps and opportunities, um, a key tool that we use is conducting life cycle inventories, life cycle assessments. So we're looking there not only is there a hazard that perhaps is, is not able to be managed um, in a fashion given the kind of exposure that you might see, but we look beyond that, right? We look at what type of, of waste that might be generated in our manufacturing processes and emissions. We look at what happens at the end of the life cycle. Are there things that we can do working with our customers to try to improve how they're utilizing materials. So that's a key way in which we identify opportunities to look at addressing gaps in the sustainability price space for our existing product portfolio. Um, another key thing I mentioned at the core of our 2015 goals is the sustainable chemistry goal, our sustainable chemistry index in particular. That's where we're assessing our portfolio and looking at selling products that are more highly advantaged in the sustainability space. Um, there are a number of, of areas, criteria that we go through to challenge ourselves with regards to how are we improving the sustainability profile um, of our business, of our corporation today. So we look at the very beginning from that extraction point. What can we do? Are there more that we can do relative to sourcing of raw materials? Can we do more recycle within our operations? Um, we look critically at doing more life cycle assessments, really understanding those areas where there are opportunities to address um, gaps and vulnerabilities. We continue to look at how can we make our manufacturing process more efficient, so there's that energy efficiency component. We look at the need of the product. We look at the challenges that we see our customers faced with relative to use of materials. Um, we also partner closely with our supply chain organization relative to, um, to their use of the material, looking at opportunities to, um, to perhaps relocate facilities near our facilities so you have less transportation um, issues, um, costs associated with that occurring. And then most importantly in the space that I and my folks deal with is in that product application arena, really challenging ourselves about the types of applications where our products are utilized. Another key activity and the kind of addressing what we're doing today is really working to strengthen our product safety program. So yesterday, for those of you that heard Christina Franz talk about ACC's prioritization tool, that's an important tool that we utilize to really go through and assess whether or not there are data gaps that need to be addressed. We don't look at everything the same, so we look critically at products that are going into consumer applications, products that might have a higher degree of hazard. So we're going through that process. We're also looking critically at our disclosure of ingredients. We're certainly, in this case, listening to our customers, 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 asking, wanting to know more about those materials that are in the products that we supply to them. So we're challenging our businesses really um, to do all they can and to look critically at, um, at um, how, um, how important is it to try to maintain that um, confidentiality. And as someone mentioned in the discussion yesterday, it's really not about not sharing the information to our customers, or our customers, customers, or consumer. It's really much more about um, the challenge of competitors, right? So we're kind of continually challenging our businesses all the time about how do we do a better job in that regard. Um, just moving on quickly, I do have a couple of case studies. I could spend lots of time on both of these, but one that I wanted to highlight for a moment is um, an alternative product line that we developed for, to, um, to replace nonophenol ethoxylates. So nonophenol ethoxylates have been workhorse surfactants. They continue to be, and they continue to be able to be used 
and are used in applications where you can minimize exposure to the environment. But this is an area where we worked hard to identify. There's lots of surfactants out there. You know, I bet there's 100,000 surfactant chemistries out there. So it wasn't the issue that there wasn't a surfactant that someone could replace NPEs with. The challenge has always been finding a surfactant that's cost effective, that's stable in the environment, but it needs to be used. Um, and the price is similar to where NPEs are. NPEs are very cheap material, cheap surfactant to make. And so that's the challenge in the space. So this material has readily biodegradable, as low aquatic, aquatic toxicity. But there was significant development to get to this point, not only de defining, designing that new chemistry, but looking at how um, gathering data to um, help our customers and customers understand how it would perform in particular different applications, generating data. So this is a particular case yesterday we talked about for a PMN, you don't have to have data, but Dow, as it moves forward with new chemistries, inputs and submits data as a part of its PMN, a part of EPA's PMN process. So we believe it's important to put forth that kind of information for the assessment that's being done. But there's also then significant investments relative to, in this case, we reconfigured a facility to be able to make this material. Now, on this slide, I particularly highlighted a couple of um, pictures that showed its use in, um, as an adjuvant in agricultural formulations, because that's been an area where we've had a degree of effectiveness with this product line. Unfortunately, in those key applications where NPEs are used as detergents, this material, although very effective, is not um, as cheap as, as our customers would like it to be. So again, it demonstrates that it's a very effective technology, but it has to be cost effective. Unfortunately, our customers and customers' customers aren't paying more, in most cases, aren't willing to pay more for a material that has an improved DHNS profile. Moving on to another case study, it's the development of Dow Building Solutions for a polymeric flame retardant to replace um, HBCD. HBCD is the flame retardant that's been used for a long time in a variety of different applications. In our case, it's for expanded poly, excuse me, it's for extruded polystyrene foam, so that's the styrofoam brand insulation. Um, the most recently in September, the design for the environment actually came out with its alternative assessment report. It's still draft, but they identified the polyFR as a viable alternative. Um, and anticipates that it's safer than HBCD. So good news, um, it's not a PBT, it is a block copolymer of polystyrene and brominated polybutadiene. So it's a large molecular weight material that doesn't have the potential to be bioaccumulated. It's largely not bioavailable, so it doesn't have the toxicity concerns associated with HBCD. Um, and, um, but you know, the point I would make here is, and this is even a greater investment than in the description that I had before the earlier case study, is that there were tens of years of effort <laughs> in looking at an alternative to HBCD. So the business actually started in the late 90s and the early 2000s, looking at the fact that there could be, there were beginning to be questions being raised here. And so we screened um, commercially available products, but in the end, this was a unique chemistry that was identified to replace the material. Lots of um, time and effort and expense went into development of laboratory testing, um, as well as going forward and doing um, renewal of certifications, fire testing performance, and making adjustments in formulations and process. So again, it's an, an example of a success from the standpoint of we're beginning to um, use this new material, but it's not without a, a significant amount of time and energy and investment to get us to this point. Just lastly, as I close the discussion today, I just wanted to highlight, and, and again, this um, relates to a discussion that we heard yesterday about um, work being done to accelerate our ability to get information on our products. Um, we take very critically um, the, um, our desire to ensure that products that we're putting out on the market place today are more sustainable, safer than those products that we have been selling in the past. And um, a key area in which we're doing that is through the use of our predictive toxicology testing. So we have um, expended significant amount of work um, working with EPA, academia, and others to do testing in this particular space. I think there was reference yesterday to testing in zebra 
um, fish. And this is an area where we're at the very early stages using this type of technology to help us understand um, the portfolio of, of, of options that we might have as we look at challenges that we're faced with. Again, we use life cycle assessment and we use a very rigorous um, stage gate process so that at various stages we're asking ourselves those right questions about um, whether or not a material is safer than the material that we're replacing. One of the tools that we use is a sustainability footprint tool where we're comparing our technology to um, existing technology that's out there in a similar kind of application. So looking at the dimensions of sustainability that are noted there, as well as looking at how does this material compare um, as we um, assess it against our 2015 goals. So thank you for the opportunity. I did that kind of in a bit of a whirlwind to help you understand and share with you some of the exciting things that we're doing in the space of sustainability at Dow and working towards really putting science into um, making the world more sustainable. Thank you. All right, we're gonna continue our whirlwind tour across what the non-government sectors are doing in terms of green chemistry and sustainability. Um, next up is David Constable. David is the director of the American Chemical Society's Green Chemistry Institute, which strives to catalyze and enable the implementation of green chemistry and engineering throughout the global enterprise. Uh, prior to his job at uh, ACS, uh, Dr. Constable worked as the owner and principal of Sustainability Foresights LLC. The consultancy was directed towards assisting companies with sustainability, green chemistry, energy, environment, health, and safety programs. <laughs> well, 